Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. We're all very excited to talk to you today about catching and fixing lead time killers before they cost you time and money. I'd like to start off by introducing myself. I'm William, and I'm on the marketing team here at Zometry. I'll be your host this afternoon. A couple of quick notes before we get started. Today's webinar will start off with a brief introduction of our panelists, followed by a quick overview of Zometry's CNC machining capabilities plus a new feature we're really excited to talk to you about. We will then dive into the meat and potatoes of our topic today, starting with a live demo of our quoting platform, and then jump into how to catch and fix those pesky lead time killers. Uh, the end portion of today's webinar will be an open Q&A for Greg and Tim. Any questions that don't get to during the webinar, or if you have any follow-up questions you'd like to ask, we will try to cover them during this final portion. At any point in time during the webinar, you can submit questions for Greg and Tim to answer by using the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And finally, we will be sending a recording of this webinar and a PDF of the slides to you within the next few days. So feel free to rewatch, rewatch, review, and share these with your colleagues. So next, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. First up is Greg Paulson. Greg is the Director of Molding and New Manufacturing Technologies here at Zometry. Greg is an expert panelist and speaker on all things custom manufacturing. He's also the star of our Engineering Challenge YouTube video series. Before Zometry, Greg was a project engineer for many years doing rapid prototyping, so he knows a thing or two about design for manufacturability and avoiding lead time killers. Our second speaker today is Tim Bowman. Tim is Zometry's lead CNC applications engineering manager and machine, machining expert. Tim has operated and managed machine shops for over 25 years while honing his machining and engineering skills at leading Fortune 500 companies. He has also facilitated the development of engineering and machining technical schools at local colleges while instructing and mentoring aspiring machinists and machine shop owners. So great, great pair of speakers for you today. So with that, uh, I will turn the floor over to Greg for a quick look at Zometry's uh, CNC machining capabilities and an exciting new feature that many of you have been asking for. Hey, William, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And as always, I, I always think that uh, we should definitely have these folks who are recording these webinars like William uh, right here in the center of this because um, they're, they're listening to the needs that are coming from our customers and really trying to coordinate this, uh, this information uh, out to you. And I think one of the biggest things you'll find about Zometry is that our goal is to help you make better parts uh, because we have many processes under our roof and today is going to be focused uh, a lot on CNC machining obviously but um, there are many many ways to make a custom manufactured part and there's uh, not not just that but there's definitely design rules per process that are really important to know to get the most out of them um, so you know Zometry for you know since our beginning we've always done CNC machining so CNC machining is uh, a subtractive process, if you think 3D printing is additive, where you are taking a blank material and then using a, a cutting tools, essentially removing that material until you get to the final shape of the part. What it allows you to do is kind of slow down, um, get uh, get right up to the edge and, ch and chip away in a very precise manner so you get very, very tight tolerances. Our typical tolerances are about uh, plus or minus five thousandths, but we can get down to the uh, one thousandths or even things like reamed holes where you're getting down to the tenth level uh, depending on certain uh, characteristics. I think uh, that was the first thing I said right now that made Tim cringe, so ignore the fact that I said tenths uh, for a second there. Uh, but we do, uh, we do have over 2,400 manufacturing partners across our network. Uh, so Zometry has a manufacturing partner network that is uh, doing the performance and filling work for Zometry uh, once you click go. And uh, that gives us uh, access to uh, three, four, five axis milling, uh, lathes, CNC turning machines, Swiss type machines, you name it. So our, our breadth of work is very, very large. Uh, and with CNC, you go every, anywhere from a, you know, let's make a part uh, and get it out there. Uh, to full spec production manufacturing, including uh, finishes, uh, you know, things like inserts, uh, uh, tight tolerances. Um, we could really make the parts that are, are two spec to your needs here. So for quite a while, we've been doing the spec manufacturing and part of this, uh, uh, part of the uh, 
the, what makes zometry zometry is our ability to take what we've learned and improve our process. And we've uh, always had consistent feedback. Like your like your parts, like your parts uh, are like your price, but lead time is a little long. So we've actually uh, integrated AI learning uh, into our uh, our program to look at parts and understand. Hey, you know what? These parts are pretty simple. Let's get them to to you in as few as three business days. And we've actually just implemented that within uh, Zometry's uh, algorithm. So now we have this this ability to instantly show um, a lead time advantage. Uh, right as you upload that file um, with, cer with certain rules. So this is the these are the rules that we have right now, which is a simple three-axis uh, mill job. Um, doesn't have off-axis or multi-axis uh, requirements like uh, like off-axis holes or surfacing. Uh, has a, uh, a relatively small build envelope for for CNC machining, which can also which can go you know very very large parts uh, as well. And uh, and also these are things where I am you know trying to get a quick uh, part out like a rapid prototype for example so I'm I'm uh, I don't have uh, additional features like for example anodize to that uh, and uh, we have live DFM warning so one of the delays that we find on the tail end sometimes is if there's a, a DFM feedback so for our, um, for the rapid uh, lead time. We're looking for parts that have the design for CNC machining. So that's really what I want to focus. What we want to focus on, and that's why we have Tim on Tim on board. So uh, to show you kind of what's new on our site here, I'm going to tab over real quick and uh, just want to briefly go over this side. We're going to spend most of our time though today going through the content of design for manufacturing and how that builds into lead time uh, optimization. Uh, so um, you all may know Zometry's uh, site. We actually have some very, very cool content. And of course, we offer many processes from machining to sheet metal to plastic and metal 3D printing, and also some tooled applications like urethane casting and injection molding are also available. And these are these are options that you can, can, you can learn more about and click through on our website. Um, I also want to highlight, um, highlight some of our resources before I go to the instant quoting site. Where we have things like the videos um, William mentioned earlier, our, our blog, which I highly recommend subscribing to, um, and design guides, which will help you understand a process further. So you may be the best CNC machine or CNC uh, part designer on the planet, but you may not know much about sheet metal or 3D metal printing, for example. And that's why I really recommend checking out these design guides because for every process that we offer, we have a, an in-depth guide for that process, so you can learn a little bit more. If you don't, if you're still in kind of a help me choose uh, situation, I recommend going up to our production guide, which is right at the top here, which is a two-pager um, per process, kind of showing you the strengths and trade-offs. Uh, like for example, F FDM 3D printing um, has a strength of relatively fast lead times. Um, larger parts can be less exp uh, less expensive than traditional manufacturing, but it sweats the small stuff. So if you have small details, it may not be the right process for you. And these are the types of things that you can learn very quickly through our production guide. We also have our live chat, as well as a help desk here that helps um, that helps you understand uh, or learn a little bit more about our parts if I do like finishes. I can go and see some of our top results here. And click through and and learn about the uh, about different processes and their finishes right away. Um, that guide is also available on our FAQ. So let's go get a quote. So I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger for you all here. Uh, so once you're logged in to Zometry's account, there's a few great things that happen. All your quotes are instantly saved online uh, with our instant quoting engine. Uh, including historic quotes and quotes that you may have pushed out for a review. Um, also, every part that you upload is available on our on your parts library. So this is something where you can go and access uh, parts from the past. You could also access this from the quoting page as well. But I did want to show you um, a parts library. So every, as you have different files uploaded, you can see how they um, how they turn out. So let's start with a couple. Uh, I'm going to actually go through a couple of situations here. Um, let's start with this. Uh, very common part that I have, which is a case body. I'm going to quote that selected part. And that's how fast you get a, uh, get a price. 
So the second, almost within seconds of your part uploading, it's analyzing the, the features and giving, giving a price out. In this case, it defaults to the least expensive material, which would be 3D printed SLS nylon. You can also see your lead time up here at three business days. And with some of our processes, you can click change lead time to add an expedite to that as needed. Um, if you click modify part or any of these features here, it'll bring you to a place where you can configure even further. Uh, so if you're if you're going beyond rapid prototyping, let's turn this into a CNC machine component. Let's go ahead and say I'm going to build this through CNC machining. So you can see uh, from our 3D printing processes, we have multiple processes for plastics and metals. CNC machining, injection molding, sheet metal, and urethane casting are available. Let's make this in a commodity material like CNC aluminum. My price instantly updates. And let's just stop there for right now. So I'm going to save properties and click through. So I can look at this at, eight, at uh, right now at eight business days, but I can also very quickly move to a lead time that is much, much quicker, like dramatically, uh, dramatically quicker um, working through. And this part has kind of a low to middle complexity to it because it still has a couple ops, but there's still a little bit more work to it. But you can see how as we've, as we've, uh, um, as we bettered our algorithm, this would have probably capped out at about seven or eight days originally. So now it's much, much quicker uh, on the lead time with very, very little change on for pricing to this. Um, if you add something, uh, add different finishes or or uh, different things like threads and tab holes, you're going to see that price uh, change uh, um, change probably a little bit more significantly if you're going from that simple simple part quick turn time to something else. Um, you, may, you may also see some uh, things like changing quantity, for example, uh, will change the price automatically and will update the lead time accordingly here. Actually, in this case, I'm at four business days because five parts, very simple. Let's go ahead and make it. Um, to give another example here, I'm actually going to go and build something slightly more complex. So I have a set of drone legs here. Let's go and let's make five, let's actually make four of these here. CNC machine, balloon 6061. And just very quickly here, you can see that uh, the lead time is increased because it has increased complexity to it. And even with Expedite, it's, it's still increased up. So you're, you'll see like a little bit more logic, a little more uh, intuition built into our lead times. Uh, but I definitely recommend checking this out. Also, this part here is actually better designed for 3D printing. You can see the sharp internal corners. Our DFM feedback is doing its job, saying that, hey, take a look at these corners. We're probably going to want to be putting a 130-second radius at a minimum on this. Or even just remove that, that gap altogether, and, and we'll get to get, get to that in a second here. Uh, other things on our site that may be new to you, again, our change lead time is fairly new to change the uh, um, change the expedite options. Um, adding certifications, so if you ever need things like material certifications, COCs, or say you're working on ITAR restricted part, this is where you would add those. And um, we also have the ability to replace the part file directly uh, within your quote. You can do that both uh, on the, at the quote summary page or right here, you can click replace for, uh, part file as well. And that allows you to take a look at this DFM feedback, go back to your CAD program, do a quick modification, save it out, replace your file, see how the price, lead time, and DFM updates live on our site. And uh, um, as I'm talking about this, uh, just uh, just remember what William said on the quote or on the question side of this. So within the GoToWebinar browser, there is a little question uh, um, field. Any questions you have as we're building along, we're going to answer those at the end of the webinar here in, um, in less than half an hour. And that's going to, um, and uh, so if there's anything about the quoting side or business model, that's a really good time to talk about that. Um, so on, let's go back to this slide, though. So, Tim, uh, are, you, are you on board? So we're going to get Tim. Yeah, just as soon as I figure out I turn myself off the mute, I'm here. <laughs> All right, awesome. So bringing on Tim Bowman, and Tim Bowman is the the guy that we all lean lean towards here at Zometry to answer the answer these questions. Like, 
how can I get my parts cheaper? How can I get the how can I get it sooner? What are the real drivers here? And these drivers are typically design related. Um, so there's there are certain things that other things like um, materials and finishes that we'll we'll touch base on. But a lot of this comes back to just kind of knowing the process, what how we're how we're making these parts, and with the understanding about how these parts are made, you're gonna have a much better understanding about how to simplify your design to make it to optimize it to get a much better pricing and lead times. And these two things definitely go hand in hand. So. Uh, uh, Tim, I, I think this is a great place for you to talk about, you know, knowing where we are and, and what are you running into here? Yeah, so when we're talking about design for manufacturing and you're talking about how to make a component less expensive or get it faster, which you were doing in this case, you, you want to look at the form, fit, and function of the part. A lot of the stuff we see are oftentimes made um, to be castings later. Well, the removal of all the, the features that make it casting but doesn't hurt your form, fit, and function reduce incredibly the lead time and, and also um, the price of your components. So when, when, you're talk, when you're thinking about sending something in, especially if it's prototype or even if it's not, look at the scope of your work. What do I need on this? Do I need aesthetic features? Do uh, I need, need it in the finished state? Do I need to anodize? Um, any of those things that you can take off reduces the lead time and the, the cost of your components. Yeah, and, and to that point, um, one of the things I, I constantly ask our customers, especially when we're talking about uh, things that are eventually going to be in production, is really what is the next what do the next two weeks look like for you? Uh, because there is a there's a very big difference on the pro prototype pro to production scale and saying like what on this order right now, What's going to get you to the to where you need to be for to satisfy whether it's your customer needs or an internal project or review, and then where do you want to be? What do you see this product in a year, right? What do I see this product in the next three months? And that may be something different, but given the lead times that we offer here, often that could be two separate projects that we can work on either in parallel or we can work with an iteration of uh, from a simple part up to a complex spec manufacturer. Um, so. You know, moving along, we we've basically separated out the bigger things that are going to help uh, um, reduce lead time for these parts, and uh, and so I'm going to start with this here, which is the rounded internal corners, and this actually has to do with uh, with how machine tools work, like how machine tools work. So we're using a round tool first off. So whenever you have a squared off corner, a round tool can't go into that that squared off area. So you're going to have to add radii there. And our DFM feedback is going to um, uh, going to pick that up. But the other thing is you're gonna you're actually going to want to look at this uh, depth of tool diameter as well, which is going to help us optimize how we're cutting that. And Tim, you know much more about this. Like, what what's the logic there? Why am I looking at that ratio of three to one? Well, well, most of the time when you're machining anything, but especially the softer materials, once you get past that three to one ratio. Um, you, you start having to actually to support the component more than you would have if you would have went above the three to one ratio. So what happens if is it'll start chattering or you can't hold tolerances because the tool's actually flexing or the according to how thin the wall is, the material's are actually flexing. Um, at, add that to the fact that the larger the radii is, the faster you can remove the material and it just makes more sense to add the largest radii you can, but stick to a, a minimum of three to one. And that makes sense because I I'm, I'm able to put a larger tool in there and just kind of hog out material. So it, like when possible, again, this is uh, you'll find that CNC machining less is more. So if you're used to additive manufacturing where it's like, look at me, I've, it's complexity is free or relatively free. Uh, it's very different with CNC. I want to keep more material on because I want to I want to reduce the um, um, the amount of work needed to get that part out. Uh, so that, and that's okay. That is, uh, that's perfectly fine if it fits within an easier project. Uh, the other thing to talk uh, talk on, this is something we catch all the time, which is this deep pocket uh, rule here. And uh, it goes to, it goes to uh, things like specialized tooling and what and what it takes to get something that is a long drilled hole. Um, but Tim, what type of rules do you have? Like, what's a good rule of thumb for you on uh, deep pockets? I, I stick with the 
eight to one ratio. Of course, there's going to be times when, you, again, your form, fit, and function will not um, allow for you to go eight to one. But you just have to realize that at that point, you're getting into specialty tooling, which is going to, you know, most specialty tools, if, if you need to go 12 to one on the ratio, um, as far as diameter of the tool to the depth of the pocket, you, you're going to get a special tool and you're looking at two, three weeks of lead time. You know, there's some that's kept on the shelf. But most of the time it's, it's pretty special. And they have tools out there that you can have made that is, is, goes as much as 20 times the diameter of the tool to the depth. But slow machining, long lead time on tooling, and relative to the material that you're cutting, um, it, it sometimes can be virtually impossible to do, period. Absolutely. And uh, and just something to note there. So the eight to one is kind of what we use. If I'm uh, if I'm a, in my 3D CAD program and I'm looking and I just said, you know, off the top of my head, eight to one is very good. If you're doing things like uh, pocketing out your parts, that 4X, the four, really four to six X uh, is is usually a pretty good idea of like what you need, especially if you're able to do really broad um, uh, radii, going back to our first rule here. Uh, that's going to allow you to get a little bit deeper because you, you, you're basically able to up the diameter of the tool, therefore being able to go, do, uh, go deeper with that. For direct drills, we have a 10x, but just understand that any anytime you're designing to the extreme, you're right on the edge of that custom tool requirement. So it's really important to understand these processes because it doesn't mean, hey, you know, when we say minimum wall thickness is 132nd, we don't necessarily mean, hey, we want your entire part to have one 30-second wall. We just mean if it's critical for the feature and for the function, that's where you should go, but don't go any further than that. So I really do recommend using these guidelines as a um, uh, as, as just that, like best, best practices and not uh, always designed to the extreme of the guideline. Um, and to that point, let's talk about tolerances. Uh, so... Uh, I do want to mention one thing here that is not uh, encapsulated on this, but this is something I actually was just running into today, which is uh, we are looking at the 3D CAD, CAD model and we're interpreting um, that CAD model to make your part uh, physically. Um, sometimes when you're designing tolerances to your model, you may have something that technically is, for example, plus or minus five, so it's within standard tolerance. But say you are actually at a limit tolerance, which where it's uh, plus zero, uh, minus 10, or vice versa. Uh, that can be really challenging if you've designed your um, your part in, in CAD to one of those extremes. I highly, highly recommend to reduce mistakes on the machining side to design to the to the nominal. So if you have an edge that is plus zero minus ten, you want to actually um, make uh, bring that edge out to to five thousand so that it actually so say it's like one inch plus zero minus ten. You want, may want to actually design that edge in CAD to one point zero zero five. Um, so uh, I'm sorry backwards uh, point uh, 995 uh, so that so that way we're able to um, machine towards that nominal and very much are much more likely achieve the results you're looking for on first cut um, and the uh, Tim I just want to know kind of what does that mean to you as a machinist though say I want to go to one thousand tolerance like what what do you do differently as you're cutting this part well it first you have to um consider what the feature is you know most concentric parts that are turn on lathes we can hold tighter tolerances with just because the the machine is driven by the center line and and then the length comes into a factor so there's a whole lot of variables that we consider but in the end what we do is we say this part's this size um this tolerance is you know five tenths over this length and then we look at when we program it you know, the closer we get to the size, the more careful we get. You sometimes use two, three, four different tools to get the dimension right once you get to a tight tolerance where if it was two thousandths greater in a, of a tolerance, you could have used, you know, two tools or one tool. So um, you also have to, you know, in between each one of those tools, you're stopping and you're checking it. So the time on the machine increases from, say, two minutes to three, a third more. Um, and still, that's feature driven. That's real generic. So uh, I hope that explanation works, but it gets very detailed yeah. at times. Absolutely. And I think this is a good time to also talk about when I'm looking at parts, when I look at simple versus complex parts, um, 
as a you know as a machinist i i think or someone in fabrications i think in operations so if i have a part where say this had a say this part featured here had no other features on the other side it's just a flat surface i may actually turn uh have this part made in two operations which is essentially i can do um one side and then flip over the part and do the other side and in theory have a finished part uh at, at the very end there um if you have something on the side, you may be adding an operation. And if you have something on two, uh, you know, more sides, then I'll be adding an operation. Or I may be adding to a higher overhead machine that may have more backlog to it, like a fourth or fifth axis. The more complex the part gets with what, what angle I'm coming in with my round end mill, it's going to really, really change those operations. As you start adding tight tolerances to that, uh, to Tim's point, not only am I um, – not only am I move, adding operations, which adds just uh, the, or the actual time it takes to make the part, but I am going to be stopping and measuring um, each operation and do what's called an in-process inspection, so IPI. The in-process inspection is going to be me stopping and measuring and then validating with the QA team on each uh, on each operation. So adding these tolerances and adding these critical features really help the stacks on, uh, and it almost multiplies. It almost has exponential effect as you start adding complexity to the part with those critical features. Then you're going to see that reflected in your lead time and price. And uh, this is something where I've I've uh, gone I've given Tim way too many uh, questions about this. So let's talk about fins and and uh, and what what walls what thin walls really mean to you? Um, so yeah, Sorry. you're right. <laughs> you have given me a lot of these, and um, to be frank, most of them are just not manufacturable. So uh, let me let me just talk about heat sinks for a moment. This is where we see most of these fans are in heat sinks. If you're designing a component that needs to be a heat sink. You know, usually it's a cover for something. Keep in mind that you can get most of those things extruded. And if you start with an extruded heat sink and then machine it the way you want it, your cost and lead time is minimal. However, if it's a totally custom heat sink, you need to maintain that, you know, that depth ratio of eight to one. And even then, there may be some fixturing required to keep these fins from you know you want it to be at least 30 second we prefer 64 but these things will vibrate in between the tool the you know the two sides will vibrate with the tool and cause some very inaccurate machining so um and again i want to go back to aesthetics here because it seems like every heat sink i see you know there's more fins than need to be in there and more locations at different angles than they need to be for the you know, function of the part. So let's stick to a, a 64th of wall thickness or, you know, a 16th, a 32nd if you can. Um, bigger the better, but again, the slower it's going to be. Yeah, and and again, to that point, um, we when we're talking about chatter, which is the vibration either of the tool that's going to too deep or the vibration of the actual feature that you're cutting, you kind of have almost a fish scale look. Uh, to the uh, to the edge of the part, which doesn't doesn't match cosmetics really well. The other thing I'm going to add to this, uh, and all these things stack on each other, right? So these are the, like look at the function of your part, look at what your real needs are, and obviously like if you do need this and if you do need this uh, parts cut that way, that's absolutely fine, and we can price it accordingly. What we want to do is make sure that things aren't overspec, over tolerance, or over engineered, where you're adding cost without necessarily adding value to your your product or your consumer uh, to this level. Um, but I, I would just uh, uh, really recommend when you're looking at heat sinks and fins, just uh, simplifying it as much as you can because they do drive costs. They can often double or triple the price of a part the part itself. Um, yeah. So, and I, you know, I could talk about this a little bit. So, there's a couple things when you're t working at working with tapped holes. So, first off common sizes and i think we have another slide here with common drill size sizes uh using co like common uh, lookup charts for things uh, like standard taps is going to be extremely helpful because it's standardized we already have a tool in stock most almost all shops already have that tool in stock so there's not going to be a delay on getting those taps uh made uh understand that most of the time uh, and most of what we what we see in our world 
is that um, thread depth is often over-engineered. And the deeper you go with the thread, uh, especially when you go over that 3x, can become very specialized because it can actually often break standard taps. Uh, if you're um, if you're using a uh, uh, something that's not necessarily like a thing like a thread forming or uh, and and you really do have uh, some challenges uh, with with that breaking with us getting a procur procuring a new tap for instance and also getting the the tap out of there so these are things that can actually break uh, like break and really delay a part unexpectedly uh, and you're adding risk to that um, I would just recommend looking at the needs looking at the fasteners that you're, you're designing for this part and understanding what's really required to uh, make my part functional. So when you're putting a drill, de uh, drill depth, which should be more than your tap depth, obviously, uh, that your tap depth is making sense uh, for what, what the requirements are. And, and the, to add to that, Greg, um, it's important to note that if you do need a specialty thread, and that happens a lot in like the optical industry and stuff, um, yeah. You have to order a gauge, and gauge, a special gauge, is sometimes five to eight weeks out. And also want to mention that, um, you know, there's a design guides for depths of threads too. But basically, it means that it, it says that fine threads, four turns are strong as twenty turns, and and with mm -hmm. coarse threads, eight turns is as strong as twenty turns. So um, I, I keep in mind and use those design guides when I'm making call outs for threads also. 100%. You know, most of the time, you know, parts are over-engineered, which isn't necessarily bad, but it, again, it may be, you may be putting more cost on your project or your customer by by accident. Uh, there, um, so, again, I said using standard taps, standard drill sizes, um, just a very, very common thing uh, that, we, that we see is where we have a hole and all of a sudden becomes... Uh, an end mill requirement versus a drill requirement. So take a look at standard, uh, especially for like things like uh, through holes. We have a counterbar, a counterbar, countersink. Uh, take a look th uh, at standard drill sizes and put those into your um, your part drawing. It'll be very very useful. I'm um, talking about drill depth ratio and just very fine features. When you start looking at those really tiny holes, so say I'm less than forty thousand, so that's less than a millimeter all of a sudden I become much more sensitive, like the extremes um, of these tools become much more se sensitive. And I have these tools that can be very expensive and they could also be, um, uh, they could also be very, very delicate, whereas the tool, the tools sometimes don't even make it to the part before they, they break on you. So just, just take a look at that and, uh, and uh, understand what your goals are for your project. Um, this also may come come in handy to understand if, if you're doing features like say you have a speaker vent, um, you may want to look at different design options like slots or uh, or other features versus multiple holes because that can act, that can sometimes have uh, similar um, or some negative effects where you may have a a quality issue or deformation with thin walls. So it starts adding on from holes to thin walls to other features as you're building your part. Um, so. And Tim, like, what is the, so aluminum sixty sixty one is our bread and butter, right? Uh, and you know, what stuff do, when you're looking at materials, like, what do you consider the commodities, and what do you consider the big lead time killers? Okay, so size is the first lead time killers. If it's over, say, it's a round part and it's over four inches of diameter, or if it's a a, a plate piece of plate stock and it's over two inches in thickness you start getting into long lead times. Um, and you're right, aluminum is our bread and butter as for most shops in America. Um, and, and, if, and if you were to say, you know, aluminum is 100% machinability, you look at stainless steel, you're at like 40%. You look at, at um, titanium, you're at like a 10% machinability. So it's a good way to measure. And you can get machinability charts offline, but you, you, it's a good way to measure how long it's going to take. If you, you get, if you know this aluminum part's going to take this long, it's going to take 90% longer to do it in titanium or, or whatever that case may be. But yeah, the, the larger met, the, the larger the metal or the more special, um, the metal titanium in bar, all those things is the longer the lead time. And I'll tell you a very common trick that we do with uh, uh, with customers when we're talking about lead time uh, 
um, lead time concerns when it comes to pressure, like or I shouldn't say it's not pressure, it's more exotic metals. Um, say you're doing a titanium, you have parts that are ultimately going to be titanium, but you're doing a fit check. Very, very often we'll actually move them into an aluminum alloy uh, to cut so they make their first runs, knowing that it's not the final material, but it'll get them to where they need to be on the, on the fit check side. It's got to dramatically reduce cost and lead time. Uh, so that way they can go flush out any design changes required, maybe do a second iteration, and then once they're final, we move to the titanium production requirements. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll take this one because I, I see this all the time. It's not just finishes, uh, like multiple finishes, but the second that you add something like chem, chem film, plating, you do a heat treatment, um, I do a powder coat, uh, for example, um, you should just understand that that adds a week. Um, very often when you're looking at the scope of your work, and if you can get a first article out without the requirement for finishing, you literally just saved a week off your lead time of those parts. Uh, so Zometry's manufacturing platform is when you go in the, when you go and order parts online, so you just can click check out or you shoot us a PO, um, we'll get these parts into production through our manufacturing partner network. And that's a, um, that's a group of, again, over 2,000 machine shops that are able to do, these work, do this work to spec and on time, and we guarantee the quality of the work being done. Uh, that being said, uh, things like plating, heat treat, uh, powder coat often are uh, outsourced activities local to that shop there. And you're, all of a sudden, you're outside, of the, you're, you're in a situation where you're relying on that vendor work. The same thing happens, by the way, when we're talking about specialized tools, when you have to order from it, you have to order a specialized tool, you're kind of at the subject of their lead times, which is why the lead time tends to extend much more than often a lot of manufacturing lead times can't do. So just understand that on surface finishes. And um, to the point of this with multiple, if you are using a, or if you do require things like masking, or I, you know, for example, I chem film, uh, chem film mask, powder coat, and then perhaps do something like a ink stamp or silk screen on the end, uh, those lead times stack because they're, sometimes they're actually staying in the same location, but often, for example, moving something from a, like a um, chemical finishing to a paint finish to a uh, marking may uh, may happen between two or three uh, different vendors. And it's just something to understand that you're we're incorporating things like the ship time, the um, uh, the time it takes to actually do the process and, and move about. So they're very very large on uh, stacking lead times. Um, and this is something we actually had a really good example of this um, that we did a case study on, where. We had a customer that was using, uh, or they had an L-shaped bracket, and they were looking to move this into a production level. Uh, and we, we were reviewing it, and because of the L-shape, they had a pocket on the inside of the L, so kind of like the short leg of L on the inside. And we would have required a drill depth ratio if it was something like 14 to 1. Um, and uh, the um, and because of that, you require specialized tooling. There's a lot of material to remove it would have been very, very difficult to keep up a production schedule with it. So we asked the customer if they could split up this part into essentially two flat parts with a precision tolerances where they could put in um, dowel pins to line the parts up, and then they had helicoils and, and screws to hold it together into the L shape. So the dowel pins held the tolerance, and the screws held the mechanical stability of that part. And by doing that, not only did we reduce the per part cost, uh, by hundreds of dollars, even though it was two parts instead of one, uh, because these because we were we were actually able to get some higher production as well. So in some some cases, it makes sense to actually simplify the part, especially if you have examples like this where you're able to uh, essentially look at walls as individual parts and think, how can I get those together? Because then you're looking at uh, simple blank sizes, smaller, shorter blank sizes. Everything has a simplified operation to it. Uh, so. You know, this is very good if you don't have sealability requirements. Uh, for example, if it's not, it doesn't need to be a watertight case, uh, as well as complexity on either side, especially on the inside of your assembly. Uh, you may want to think about removing that uh, that as a separate feature to add on later. Um, and uh, yeah, the or sorry, sorry, I'm about to sneeze here, guys. I'm gonna mute myself for a second. All right, <laughs> sorry. False alarm, but the uh, term the term parts here um, we're feeding from a rod stock that we can actually um, put into a lathe, 
and feed through, make a part, then pull out more rod automatically within this machine, feed through, make that part, and move through. If you have parts that look like this, typically the lead time is um, about three to four days shorter than a CNC machine part. Uh, and that has to do with the setup requirements, where you there there's very very little setup other than the programming and fixturing of the of the rod stock itself. If you're able to design parts with concentric features or something that's on axis, um, you are going to see significant uh, reduction of lead times as well as reduction of price per part. Usually, term parts tend to be much much cheaper. The second that you add something like a milled slot on the side. Um, or sometimes you get away with off-axis holes here, but just one hole through uh, one hole through the side here. You, you may either require specialized turning your equipment, or may become a secondary. Take my part off the machine and then mill it. So just understand that um, very very small subtle features can move a turn part to a part that requires either multiple steps, where it goes to a mill machine for some final operations, and that's going to typically add a couple of days back to your lead time. So, Tim, what does it really mean? Like, what is a, when I talk about materials certs, um, when I talk about export res restrictions, why does that add time to my part? Well, many times you have to go through a broker instead of a retail dealer to get materials um, with certain certifications on it or, or restrictions. Um, you know, instead of going to Granger or somebody ordering this piece of aluminum, now I have to go to my broker, which we all have. We all have brokers that supply our material, um, and, and they can get it for you. But now it's coming from a mill. It takes two days to get to those guys. Um, they check it, make sure it's in order, and send it to you. So it's four days before you get the material instead of overnight and having it in one. And, of course, non-standard inspection reports are, are often often drive lead time simply because you usually need something special, whether it's a CMM machine or it's a, you know, some kind of shadow graph, something that normally isn't just mics or calipers that you have right there at the machine. Um, or or some of, some, sometimes it's destructive testing. Whatever the case may be, if it's non-standard, there's going to have to be something special bought or made to check it and it drives lead time. Yeah, and I could I can attest that I know um you know our our internal QA which uh, QAs uh, many of the parts going out to our customers, um our our uh, CMM team is running nonstop multiple shifts off and weekends, uh, because things like C CMM reports, um you have the actual time it takes to run the machine against the part, but also things like programming setup uh, if there's a fixture requirement for those parts, and and typically, the second that you say CMM inspection, you're adding about three days to your um, to your lead time. Uh, the other thing to note is things like export restric restrictions. They limit the supplier base naturally. So Zometry, we do ITAR work um, all the time. In fact, actually, I think we're very, very well known to be a terrific ITAR supplier because we make it so easy uh, to, to source parts through Zometry. And we have a, a manufacturing partner network that is entirely I ITAR as well. So we're able to channel that within our ITAR group. Uh, that being said, it's just not the same size as the as our entire manufacturing network. So you tend to see increased uh, costs costs as well as increased lead time uh, just uh, due to the basic economics of it. So, you know, we are um, you know we just went through a lot of information, but it really comes to these the, each one of these tips stacks on on itself. So if you have things like a thin wall with a with a uh, um, high drill depth ratio. If we uh, have uh, um, parts uh, that are highly complex and they're um, and I have a lot of mill time, if I have to add additional operations, uh, diff additional like multi-axis milling, um, all of a sudden I'm really increasing the cost and the um, the work, and that really is that scope to it. Uh, to decrease that, it's looking at simplification. It's looking at um, using basic uh, tap sizes, basic drill sizes, um, uh, making sure that if you don't need to remove material there, just don't because it's more work for the for the CNC machine in action. Um, things like knowing where your project is. If I'm in a prototype level, do I need that finish? Uh, do I need to have these uh, uh, these certain features? Do I even need that particular material? Are going to be very very important things to understand. 
And we're here to help guide you and, and give you that instant feedback as well through our site on what that really means for you from our, that price and lead time. I know we have CAD add-ins, we have our online site where you go and configure and add some features through. Um, but it's, a, it's just really important to know that all these things really work together uh, and can be optimized for your part and for your process. Um, I mentioned these before. Uh, so Zometry, we do have our fun YouTube series here. So we have a, uh, um, you know, we do a lot of videos where uh, I kind of, kind of edutainment. Uh, a lot of it's focused around 3D printed parts, uh, but we also have some really cool stuff on our machine shops or network supplier bases but as well that may be very interesting for you. Our design guides are also just excellent. I really, really recommend these, uh, downloading these, sharing this with your team, because they can bring you much further along. And uh, we are always building uh, new stories. In fact, if you are a Zometry customer and there's a story that you want to share with us, uh, please reach out to us and we're, we're always happy to take a look and build something around that. Um, we love hearing these things. You know, I was talking about this, this supercharger, um, get a random email saying, hey, you know, I printed a part in SLS. I've been using it in my supercharger for over a year. And it's working great. And I was like, this is awesome. Let me get you in touch with our marketing team to tell your story because of, it's just so cool to see how practical some of this, uh, some of this work is. And we're always excited to see where and how the work that we're doing is uh, is being used. That being said, most of our work is confidential. So that's why we always ask, if you want to share it, let us know because we can't share much of what, what work we're doing. Um, we have live support. Uh, so that little chat bubble at the bottom left of the, of the website, uh, that is open 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern, as well as our phone line. Uh, and email support at zometry.com is our catch-all. Uh, so any questions you have, or if you're sending out orders, or if you're um, looking to, uh, if you're looking for updates or material suggestions, please uh, use support at um, We'll find the right place for it and get you an answer as soon as we can. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note, and this is very important, especially for some legacy machine components, is we have a a, a partnership with Zverse. And Zverse, uh, we have uh, links on our site that can actually take you directly to um, their their basically 3D file quoting engine. Uh, but what they um, what they do is they they do 3D modeling. So if you do have a 2D file, like say you have a drawing of a legacy component, you can go and um, build this. Uh, you could actually go and get a get a quote for what it will take to turn that into a 3D file if you don't have that ability uh, naturally. And I think uh, Zverse has worked really well, especially with some of these companies that are larger companies that have had, haven't had the resource to actually turn that 2D file into a 3D conversion. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, so that's what we have uh, for our presentation. And I think we actually have, uh, you know, we have about 15 minutes or so to take some questions. Um, Will, did you see anything coming through? Uh, yeah, we have, we have one question right now. So if you have questions, uh, keep them rolling in. Um, so the first one here is uh, looking at like internal corners and a three to one ratio. Will mm -hmm. our quoting engine let a user know that they can optimize those to lower the cost? So that's something that um, I think we're excited to do, but right now it's looking for strict manufacturability feedback. And so we have uh, essentially um, hard rules encoded, for example, on uh, um, uh, I think I showed you earlier what those internal corners look like. Uh, look like so you'll, you'll get highlights there. Thin walls will highlight um, confined halls, inaccessible areas. So say you had an area where, um, imagine if you cut cut the side profile apart, you saw like the shape of an L, like that 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 void uh, um, where the uh, short end of the L would be would be something that you just can't access. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at. So it's actually can I physically manufacture some process? It's not necessarily um, what's the what's the thing that's going to reduce the cost of this part or reduce the lead time so that's still something where a lot of times we can take a look at your part and give you a, a few quick feedbacks but most of what we talked about today is really our our hit list on what we're when we're thinking about this and when we're thinking about pro solving your problem that's this is basically a thought process we're going down nice um got another one here uh, CNC machining plastics. Um, I don't know if you, if you want to speak to that a little bit. I know some of the rules might be a little bit different when working mm -hmm. with plastics versus metals. Um, somebody just want to speak to that maybe. 
Yeah, Tim, do you want to cover that one? Okay. Yeah, so so naturally plastic is going to be less rigid than metals, and therefore, you know, that the thinner you get, the less likely you are to hold tolerances. You 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 know, you can drill holes in a two-inch piece of plastic, be it Dalran or, or PVC or whatever, um, and, and get a pretty good, you know, tolerance. However, what you're not going to get is it's probably not going to be straight. There's probably going to be voids in the material or melting factors that come into play. So normally, if you want, there are some plastics that are better than others, of course. This is, this is again, one of those that are, have a lot of variables. So you can get stuff that's um, glass filled that is a lot more rigid than just plain whatever, acetyl, um, PVC. But so the tolerances, the smaller you get with a component in plastic, the less likely you are going to be able to hold any tolerances. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I could so, go into this days, but. So I'll say as a general rule, double it. Double your tolerance ex expectations, uh, double the rules like wall thickness and things like that are going to be a very, very good start with plastic uh, manufacturing. Um, to Tim's point, there's different materials, different stiffnesses. So if you're looking at anything that's like, you know, like things like soft, like nylons or anything that ends with ylene to it, like polyethylene, uh, polypropylene, uh, those things, they're almost slippery uh, when you're when you're trying to do work holding. So, so sometimes you see the most clever work holding solutions just to hold the part still enough to cut um, to cut through. And even then, uh, thin walls and gaps, you may see chattering, you may see uh, sometimes uh, warping, which can occur because of uh, different temperatures as the, as the material is being cut versus as it is in a room temperature state. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into uh, plastic manufacturing, but it really is keeping that as simple as possible. I do recommend also 3D printing options uh, if you are looking for a plastic manufacturing requirement, especially on the prototype level, because that can help, help you work through your validation stages and save a ton of time and, and expense, um, especially when you're looking at the onesies, twosies, um, in manufacturing, as you move to higher manufacturer, makes a lot of uh, sense, especially if it's designed for CNC machining, to move to CNC machining from there. Another good question here, and something we didn't really cover, is uh, what would we recommend for undercut features? Okay, so, you know, the bad thing about all these questions are I, I, I see undercuts and I think of undercuts on ODs, IDs, and milled features. Um, so, so let me just say with lathe, it, it doesn't matter. About any undercut you want, you can do as long as you can get a tool inside the, the you know, the ID of the part. However, with milled um, undercuts, for example, in a square pocket, it can't be any deeper. Um, how do I explain it? Um, you have to have clearance for the shaft of the tool. So it can't be any deeper from the edge of the pocket than the pocket is in width. Does that make sense? I'm uh, gonna try, let me see if I could use the cool drawing tool that we have here. All right, so what Tim's talking about is say this is my, my pocket here and I have an undercut here, right? So I need to not only clear this undercut with my tool, but I need to be able to um, clear the other side. So this is like a terrible drawing because it's perfect and it clears the undercut. But say my say my pocket was um, say my pocket was like this. I have this distance from here to here that I actually need to move my tool this direction for, which moves my tool this direction. So I uh, so I need to make sure that my hole can actually cover that undercut. Tim, is that what kind of what you're talking about? Absolutely, that's what I'm talking about. I'm glad you got a drawing tool. Look at look at the pen tool, guys. It's my first time using it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, what else we got, William? Uh, so here's another one. Uh, does the 10 to 1 hole standard change uh, between blind holes and through holes? 
So that's going to have to do – so there's a couple things with that. So if you have a flat bottom, then yes, so on a, on a blind hole uh, because all of a sudden I'm milling that bottom. So I'm actually using the end mill rule, and so I'm almost treating like a pocket. If I'm using – if I have a, uh, a angled bottom, you know, so accommodating for the drill tip, then I could usually hit that 10 to 1 ratio on a blind hole. Um, on the on the through holes, uh, so there's there's a couple ways that you can approach it, but you still want to really use that um, use a 10 to 1, and if you're using a standard drill size, if not, then the, there's there's ways to flip your part and mill on the other side, but you are incorporating risk of having something even when it's honestly even when it's uh, aligned, you know, two three thousands off, you could see that edge, and so it may be in spec. But if you had to flip the part to get the other side of the hole, um, you may have, uh, you know, fitment issues if you're putting, for example, a shaft through. And Tim, do you have anything else to say on that? But I, I've, this is what I've observed in the past. Yeah, yeah no, you're exactly right. Um, it, it's it's going to be, okay, so for a lathe part where everything's considered and you're talking about a center hole, um, it's much easier to not have that parting line in there because you can pick it off if you can use two, two – um, spindles and you can pick it off and then it's it's pretty much lined up however on milled stuff it's almost impossible to get those two holes to line up perfectly um but if it's a clearance hole yeah you can go 20 to 1 and and just drill it from both sides does that answer yeah i think so um and then here's uh, another one and I think this one kind of goes back to our, our recording engine and live demo. So other, other tolerances, other tolerances than the standard. Um, so if you, if someone were to request higher tolerances, uh, how do they request those tolerances uh, since the 3D model does not have those? So let me get out of pen mode here. Um, normal non-dry mode. Okay. Make sure I could do this. So I am on. Uh, so I'm back on the the quote demo that we were looking at before. So. I did a very quick overview, but you can go very. Um, you could go from a uh, very simple to much, much more in depth. So, say for example, I wanted to add black anodized here. Um, say this uh, two tapped holes. So first off, it's yelling at me for a drawing because it's going to say, "Hey, I know how much this costs, but I really want to know what what that tap is. Like, what's what's the? Uh, is it like 10:32, for example? We have an option for a CNC machining where you can actually put your tightest tolerance in. The way this work is, works is say you have four locations that have a tighter tolerance than five thousandths of an inch. Um, you look at your tightest, um, tightest tolerance, so say it's two thousandths, and you put your total locations in. And that's going to update the quote accordingly. So if you see how this uh, works, so say I moved, we had like 479 each, say I'll move to a one thousandths, you can see how the price jumps up, um, and four thousandths here. So that's where you you apply this but just note that when you have that information it's going to ask for a drawing and uh really what we want you to do is you for you to call out the exception and not the rule so uh um so what's what is what is the thing that the machine is to be highlighting here so if you do have a like just a standard technical drawing absolutely it's perfect to deliver that but at a minimum we really want to know where are those tight tolerances you know what are they relative to and um and and we're going to assume everything else is going to be the standard uh, for that. If you need verification, so say you're at one thousandths of an inch and you need verification um, and you're looking at a line-to-line -line dimension, I, I'd recommend uh, looking at something like a standard inspection uh, with dimensional report where you'll get a um, you'll get that report in hand so you can take a look at all the dimensions written out. If you have something that say for example is a surface profile or Maybe not one or two true positions, but a series of true positions. So, say you had a had a plate that had um, you know 18 uh, true position locations across a series of a of um, a series of holes. There, I would almost recommend doing a CMM inspection and getting that report through uh, if that's if it is a very tight uh, positioning, uh, because that's going to be probably one of the best ways for us to, for us internally to verify that as well. Um, but you can request those inspection reports. Um, uh, to, and these would be reports that are easy to, really, uh, easy to read and deliverable to you uh, as well. But this is where you would where you would be putting in the tolerance, for instance, and even things like if you have requirements of uh, like part marking and bag and tag, uh, you can you can place those here. So let me go back. All right. 
And do you have time for one one more question? I think we're right about time here. Yeah, so one more question. Um, uh, machining small parts. Uh, so what's kind of like the smallest features uh, we can machine in general? I'm going to lean on Tim for that one because uh, there's there's small features and there's micro machining and it's a very fuzzy line sometimes. Right, and, and it is. Um, of course, we usually don't like to go under a 30 second with any tool, maintaining the same rules, the uh, 8 to 1 and the 10 to 1 ratio. Um, however, once you get in the parts that the total size of the part is less than a half an inch and it has a multiple multitude multitude of features you know if it has five or six features and all of them's got five thousandths radii in them um that, that's going to go to a totally different type of machining it's going to go to micro machining like like um well like greg was just talking about however if it's it's a lathe part you can actually do it on a swiss machine and most of those small things we do have partners that can do it now on on lay small lathe parts mill parts let's don't go over under a half inch with two or three features yeah and to, to what tim's describing as a swiss machine again you're looking at you can have um usually your base is going to be some sort of rod like stock uh to it and then you'll be cutting um you can cut off axis features with a with a swiss machine uh, as needed um, but the Swiss machines works a little bit different than most uh, turnings because the cutting motion is uh, happens almost right at the base where the part's held. So it mitigates uh, that chatter, the vibration of the parts. So say you have um, all of a sudden when you're working on really small parts, that that drill depth ratio, that stuff is actually real short. Like it's because uh, the part's so small that it, it uh, um, and it's usually all your features are so, so small that the slots are, you know, all of a sudden, you know, eight to one just instantly the second that you put a slot into the part. And so Swiss machines tend to hold parts uh, and cut them right at where they're holding to reduce vibration of it, where a standard turning machine like a like a lathe will actually have the cutting tool moving along with the length of the part uh, versus the part moving along with the length of the tool, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and I think that's you know uh, William. Unless there's any any other quick questions, I I think that's uh, that's it. We're right at the uh, we're at that 2:03, but we're right at the 2 p.m. mark. Um, the big thing is any 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 questions that we didn't address, um, we we're happy to take a look at those and address those uh, um, after this webinar. And again, if uh, if you have any questions uh, to us, you can email uh, Tim or I, or you can email support at and we're we're happy to follow up with you. All right, I think that's that's good. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, like Greg said, we'll try to follow up with any questions we weren't able to get to. Uh, so with that, have a great rest of your day. All right, thank you all so much for your time. Have a great day.